Folks, what we have done is, as you can tell, is we split the groups into half so that you can be assigned to a room to watch a demo of the case that you're going to try. This is a little bit of an experiment with you all in the sense that usually we don't do closing arguments in the case that you are going to do, and there are some dangers or downsides of doing a closing argument demonstration in the case that you're going to do. The fear is that you will uh, take notes and copy this and not make your own decisions about how your case goes. Uh, obviously, these are examples, and in fact, what we have is we've told the folks that they're not going to do a full closing. In a case like State versus Cortez, you probably would close in a much longer period of time. Um, you will see that what these folks are doing is they're showing you pieces of the closing, and they will talk to you about some of the choices that they're making about what they would otherwise cover. We hope that you find that this is helpful in your preparation to see these closing arguments. Let me make one quick announcement, then I'm going to turn it over to Susan Steingast to be the moderator for this session. Um, the, the announcement is about your witnesses, and just to say to you, we've got, we're trying to make this as realistic an experience as we can make it for you. You'll have a jury there, and so you'll be trying this case, and what we want you to realize is that you might like to have somebody who is the same sex as the person who is the defendant or who is uh, the victim or who is the witness that you've got. And so we want you to treat your witnesses as a witness pool, all right? That you can go outside just the two people that are assigned to you. That may mean that people will play witness roles in more than one trial in order to be able to make that happen. That would happen anyway in the sense that you would have to be more than one witness if you were just assi assigned within a trial. So this is something that it shouldn't increase your work. It's, uh, but it is the obligation of the witness pool to be available and to then perhaps work with more than one group in order to be able to get the witness roles filled out. We remind you that there's just this one strange thing that I have to do, which is to certify that you are also available as a witness and played your witness role. So do not <clears throat> skip out until you've got permission from folks. There's nothing more frustrating to the program when they can't find people who have been assigned to be their witnesses. So please cooperate. It's been going great here. Everybody worked great when they did the, the Gonzalez case, and if you would keep that same spirit going for the last part of the program, we'll finish strong. Let me turn it over to Susan Steingast now, who will introduce the closing argument demonstration. Susan? Thank you, Paul. We are going to be hearing from two very experienced and excellent lawyers in a few moments. They have asked me to remind you that if they appear to be stopping dead in the middle of something, it's because they, are doing, they may very well be doing pieces of, of this uh, argument. Uh, Ms. Markowitz has told me that this would easily be a one-hour closing in the real world, if not more, and I'm quite sure Mr. Vanderlaan would say the same thing. So know that you are seeing an abbreviated piece of work. Uh, we are about to begin the closing arguments in State versus Cortez. For the prosecution, Robert Vanderlaan, who will go first. For the defense, Liz Markowitz. Mr. Vanderlaan. May it please the court. Ladies and gentlemen, it's March 9, 2010, about 9.30 p.m., outside of Herman's Restaurant on 4th Street in the state of Emory. A black 2008 Honda drives up right outside the door, and the defendant, Juan Cortez, and his partner, get off the motorcycle, and they walk in to Herman's restaurant. The defendant, Juan Cortez's partner, 
walks to the middle of the restaurant and raises a 38 caliber pearl handed Smith and Wesson revolver owned by defendant Juan Cortez's wife given to Lewis Grimes on February 3rd 2010 which also happens to have Juan Cortez's fingerprint on it and that man announces to the 64 people who thought they would go to that restaurant and simply have dinner that this is an armed robbery and he told those people that they needed to take their money and that they needed to take their jewelry and put it in a bag. As that was happening, things went terribly wrong, and the defendant, Juan Cortez, took his 9 millimeter revolver <clears throat> and he shot and fired at an innocent law-abiding, defenseless, 22-year-old architectural student by the name of Joseph Schmidt and killed him. And then Juan Cortez, leaving his partner behind, went out of that restaurant, got back on that black 2008 Honda with a license plate that says, <laughs> G-Y as the first two letters and he drove about three and a half to four blocks home so he would be there before five minutes to ten. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a murder case and it's an armed robbery case and it's important to understand that. Because on behalf of the people of the state of Emory, we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt these facts that I have just told you. We have proven beyond a reasonable doubt the elements of three felonies, malice murder, felony murder, and armed robbery. The elements of malice murder are right here. Defendant acting alone or with one or more persons, that would be Lewis Grimes, caused the death of Joseph Schmidt. He killed Joseph Schmidt in cold blood. The death caused was unlawful, and the defendant, in causing the death, acted with malice. Judd Steingast will tell you in a few minutes what the word malice means. It is the unlawful intention to kill without justification, excuse, or mitigation. Folks, there was no excuse. There was no mitigation and there was no justification to kill Joseph Schmidt, a 22-year-old boy minding his own business in cold blood. Notice, none of those elements say that I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Juan Cortez needed money, that he was in a gang, that somebody burned his garage down. We have proved these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Felony murder. That the defendant Juan Cortez acting with Lewis Grimes committed or attempted to commit the crime of armed robbery. Lewis Grimes told people to put their money and their jewelry in a bag in the middle of Herman's restaurant. In the course or in furtherance of that armed robbery or the immediate flight therefrom, the death of Joseph Schmidt was caused. It was an armed robbery, that 38 caliber pearl handled. Smith and Wesson belonged to the Cortez family and that's a stipulation that we have in this case. Armed robbery, defendant took something 
The defendant's purpose was to commit theft. The thing taken was from the person or presence of another. It was taken against the will of the person robbed. An offensive weapon or any replica, article, or device having the appearance of such a weapon was used. Folks, we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt armed robbery. Nothing in these elements says that we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was in a gang, somebody burned down his garage. We don't even have to prove motive. Do you see where motive is in that element? No. Although he had a motive, he needed money. Whether it was because he's been out of a job for five months, whether it was because his wife wasn't working and the family needed income, whether that service garage had been burned down, whether he needed $150,000 to pay back Robert Unger as a motive, doesn't matter. Those are not elements that we need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, reasonable doubt is defined this way, and the key word is hesitate. Hesitate is a key word in this entire jury instruction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the people of the state of Emory's burden to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant has rights in this case, and he's got the right to due process. He's had that right. He's had a fair trial. He's been provided that right. As part of that right, he could decide not to call any evidence, not to call any wit witnesses. We know that. But instead, instead, defendant Juan Cortez chose to exercise his due process right and call witnesses and put in evidence. And I want to comment on that. But something has just occurred to me. While the prosecution and the people of the state of Emory have rights, and while the defendant Juan Cortez has rights, there's somebody else who has rights here. Somebody else has rights in this case, and ladies and gentlemen, that's you. Because you have the right to use your common sense in this case. And when I say you have the right to use your common sense, what I mean by that is you have the right to judge these facts that we have proven not just once, but in many forms, you have the right to use your common sense that the facts we've proven show that these crimes, malice murder, felony murder, and armed robbery have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. For example, the motorcycle. There's the 2008 black Honda. It's been identified. Who owns it? Well, we know who owns it. It is Juan Cortez. We know that GY is the license number. How about the gun? There it is, the pearl-handled 38 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol owned by Maria Cortez with Juan Cortez's fingerprint on it. We've proven this beyond a reasonable doubt. How about how this crime was committed? Well, how long does it take to go from Juan Cortez's home to pick up Louis Grimes, to drive a few blocks to get to Herman's restaurant? But more importantly, how long does it take to drive back? Up 4th Street, Woodruff Lane, onto church, and be back this three and a half or four blocks, can you negotiate all of that in 15 or 20 minutes? Most people might say that you could drive eight to 15 miles in 20 minutes, let alone three and a half to four blocks. How about the restaurant? We know that defendant Juan Cortez was here. We know that Joseph Schmidt we know that 
Louis Grimes, and everybody was in that restaurant. Louis Grimes has told us that. There was no reason for people to wear a bandana as far as Louis Grimes' testimony is concerned because Louis Grimes knew who he was rolling with on that 2008 Honda motorcycle. And we know that Joseph Schmidt was killed because here is Claire Diaz's medical opinion, medical examiner, that he was killed and that it was a homicide. Now, I suspect that in a few minutes, after I sit down, we're going to hear a couple of things. First thing we're going to hear is something along the lines that you can't trust the testimony of Lewis Grimes. Because Lewis Grimes flipped. He's testified against the defendant, Juan Cortez. And you can't trust that testimony. And this is the kind of man that you really wouldn't want around. This is the kind of guy that nobody likes. And he's a felon. And you can't believe it. This is my comment on that. I don't have the luxury to go to Hollywood, to go to central casting, to go to the church and pick out my witnesses. I have to use the witnesses who committed the crime. I'm going to tell you something else. Louis Grimes was okay for Juan Cortez. I didn't pick Louis Grimes. Juan Cortez picked Louis Grimes. And Louis Grimes is the man who points a finger and who got a plea bargain. But that shouldn't be a surprising reality to you, ladies and gentlemen. If you've ever watched a TV program or a movie, you know that plea bargains are an accepted part of criminal law. It's the way you not only get one conviction, but you get two convictions when somebody will finally step forward and tell the truth. I don't apologize for having to use Louis Grimes because Juan Cortez has never apologized for having included Louis Grimes in the commission of these three felonies. I suspect we're going to hear something about what is known as an alibi. You know what an alibi is? An alibi is real simple. It's an explanation for why somebody wasn't someplace. We may hear in a couple of moments about an alibi because we saw evidence about an alibi. I don't think there's any secret. I don't think it's very surprising that the defendant, Juan Cortez, had his wife come in here to provide an alibi. He had Robert Unger come in here, but Robert Unger is a non-entity on this alibi because Robert Unger made a telephone call at 8.15, according to Cortez, and never showed up until shortly before 10, and this whole case happened around 9.30. And a little bit before that, at 9 o'clock, when Louis Grimes, using a prepaid calling card, notify, when Juan Cortez used a prepaid calling card and paged Louis Grimes and told him, we will pick you up about 9.15, 9.20. Now, here's what the jury instruction says about alibi. <clears throat> and you notice the key word here has been underlined when you're talking about the entire jury instruction of alibi, we're talking about an impossibility that the defendant was there. An impossibility that the defendant, Juan Cortez, could have been at Herman's restaurant at 9.30 p.m. on March 9, 2010. Does his alibi provide that impossibility? 
Well, let's call up this timeline that I put together. Folks, the critical period of time is 845, 9, 915, 930, 945. Not one single witness that the defendant Juan Cortez chose to bring to this court can tell you, I saw Juan Cortez at 9.30. Shortly before, shortly after, but at the critical periods of time, 8.45, 9, 9.15, 9.30, there's the impossibility that this alibi holds up. Now you're going to go back shortly and deliberate. You're going to be able to reach a conclusion in this case. And it's one of some amount of gravity. It's not easy to go back and deliberate in a case that I call a capital case, a murder case. But you have to do it. You've taken an oath. It's not easy to say to yourself, am I fighting the evidence of proof beyond a reasonable doubt, or am I fighting the fact that, you know, I've got to make a heavy decision, and I have to point the finger and say, Juan Cortez, you are guilty of killing somebody. Malice murder, felony murder, and you are guilty of an armed robbery. But that's what the evidence here presented indicates, and that's what your verdict ought to be on behalf of the people of the state of Emory. And when you get back there and you deliberate, you will be given a jury verdict form. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what that form is going to look like. And on behalf of the people of the state of Emory, I would ask that you have your foreman sign his name right here where it says, we the jury find the defendant Juan Cortez guilty of armed robbery. We the jury find the defendant Juan Cortez guilty of malice murder. And we find the defendant Juan Cortez guilty of felony murder. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on behalf of the people of the state of Emory, I thank you. Thank you, Judge. May it please the court, Mr. Vanderlaan. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, while Mr. Vanderlaan was very eloquent and he can talk without notes, I'm pretty nervous. Um, and I'm nervous because this is the last opportunity that I have to talk to you on behalf of my client, Juan Cortez, on a very important matter. While this case is tragic on many levels, especially for Mr. Schmidt, who lost his son Joseph, it is equally tragic for Juan Cortez. It's tragic because he is on trial for a crime that he clearly did not commit. The ultimate question, what I told you in the beginning of this case, is not, was there a death? There was a death. It wasn't, was there an armed robbery? There was an armed robbery. The question I told you that you would have to ask yourselves during this trial, while the witnesses were testifying, is who? Who was with Lewis Grimes? Oh, well, Mr. Vanderlaan wants to stay up, stand up here and tell you that he has proven his case beyond a reasonable doubt. I'll tell you what he has proven beyond a reasonable doubt. He has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Lewis Grimes went into Herman's restaurant and robbed the place. And that's all that the state of Nita has proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt is not two sides. 
That's not enough. That's not the standard. You can't just pick a side in this case. The judge will tell you that a not guilty verdict in this case can mean one of two things. The first, which I think is what the state has shown and what I have proven to you, which is Juan Cortez did not commit. He was not the person that was there with Lewis Grimes. But even more, what a not guilty verdict means is that Mr. Vanderlaan, on behalf of the state of Emory, didn't prove his case. You've listened to me for the course of this whole trial. It's been more than a full day. And you know how I react to Mr. Vanderlaan and his questioning and when I object. And I'm going to ask you that while you're back in the jury room, when you hear information from each other, when Mr. Vanderlaan gets back up and talks to you, when you hear things that don't make sense, you object for me. This is the last time that I get to talk to you, and so if I forget something, it's not because it wasn't important. It's maybe because I just forgot. And again, it's your collective memories. It's what you heard from the stand that's important. And so talk about it in the jury room. If you think that Juan Cortez was with Lewis Grimes, if you feel like he was, then you must return a verdict of not guilty. Because thinking and feeling is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. If you still have questions, if you still wonder what, what exactly was going on, who, who for sure was in there, then you blame Mr. Vanderlaan. It was he who said in the beginning, I gladly accept the burden of proof. Well, now you take that burden. And unfortunately, you did not prove your case. If you still have questions, if you would have liked to have heard from somebody, one witness of the 64 people that were having dinner at Herman's, who could say, I saw Juan Cortez there, then you blame him. I submit to you that the reason you haven't heard anybody come in other than Lewis Grimes is because there isn't anybody. Why not? Because Juan Cortez wasn't there. The only person who identified Juan Cortez at the scene was the person who we know was at the scene. Mr. Schmidt never made an identification. He couldn't. He saw the person and no other patron. What is reasonable doubt? It is just that. It is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. The fact that nobody other than a perpetrator can identify who was with him raises for you a doubt for which you can state a reason and you must acquit. The judge will tell you the same thing. Mr. Vanderlaan is right. You don't leave your common sense at home. You are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses. And like Mr. Vanderlaan said, I will talk about the fact a little later on that Lewis Grimes only comes up with this story when he is told specifically by Officer Moss. You heard Officer Moss. He told you, I told Grimes. If you tell me it's Cortez, not tell me who was with you, but tell me it was Cortez, I'll get you a deal. If that raises a question for you as in terms of what the truth really was 
And it should raise that question, what the truth really was. That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. The judge will go over different kinds of evidence. There's direct evidence and there is circumstantial evidence. And this really is a circumstantial evidence case. And what the judge will tell you is that in circumstantial evidence cases, you have to exclude every other reasonable hypothesis but that of the guilt of the defendant. Meaning if there's another equally plausible story, and in this case we have plausible facts, then you must acquit. Because it means the state, the man who willingly took on that burden, Mr. Vanderlein, has not proven his case beyond a reasonable doubt. Circumstantial evidence is like a chain link fence. And if one chain is broken, the fence falls down. So in this particular case, you heard Mr. Vanderlein's evidence. You heard Joe Schmidt, uh, I mean um, Herman Schmidt, say that he had information from his son that it had been either Mr. C or Mr. Z who had come in and tried to extort the business. And that that same night of the armed robbery, on March 9th, that his son, what he inferred was saying it was the same man, was back in the shop, back in the restaurant. What? If it was really Mr. Z. Because it was Mr. Z. So the fact is, is if it's Mr. Z, which is not my client, Mr. Cortez, was the person that Joe recognized, that is a doubt for which you can attach a reason. Because Mr. Von der Leyen has come in and told you through his witnesses in his opening statement that it was Juan Cortez that had been extorting the businesses. What sense does it make? I would agree with Mr. Von der Leyen. This is not an airtight alibi case. It would be nice if it was. But that's not what happens. You would question if every single witness that I presented to you could tell you the exact time and if it fit perfectly. But the truth of the matter is, is that there was a ba basketball game at 9 o'clock. And that Juan had told his wife, have dinner for Pastor Unger and I. We're going to eat maybe around 8.30. And the game starts at 9, and it probably goes to 11, 11.30. And that was the plan. What sense does it make that they would have already set up their meeting? Juan had no idea, not until the very last minute, that Pastor Unger was going to be late. If you're asking yourself, yeah, that doesn't really make any sense. How could he have two plans at the same time? What are you, just, just in case I got one in my back pocket? That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. The law and alibi. If you combine that with reasonable doubt, basically this is what it is. Mr. Vanderlaan has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Juan couldn't have been at home. And he can't. I would submit to you that not only has Mr. Vanderlaan, on behalf of the state of Emory, been able to show that it was Juan Cortez 
that was with Lewis Grimes. But he can't show you beyond a reasonable doubt that Juan couldn't have been anywhere else but at Herman's, because we know he could. And how do we know that? Let's talk about what evidence that we heard. We heard from Maria, Juan's wife. They've been married for six years. They have two children and one on the way. And she knew about his former history with the MS-13. It would be nice if he had had some, somebody from the district attorney's office, a police officer that actually was coming over to dinner. But the reality is, is that if I was to ask you, where were you on March 9, 2010, most of you would say, at home with my family. And when I say to you, prove it, you would bring in your spouse, your roommate, somebody who you had been with. And so Maria comes in and testifies. And she tells you, we, as far as I was, had known, because I was making dinner for Pastor Unger. And how do we know she does? Because she told you, I saved him a plate. Dinner was expected to be at 8.30. And at 8.15, she does get a phone call. And she gives the phone over to... Um, to Juan after, but we know that originally he was supposed to have been there. Maria tells you some other things about Juan. She tells you how they met. They met at church. She tells you that he clearly was a motivated man. That he became good friends with Pastor Unger through Christ Emory Church and through the prisoner program. She told you that after they got married, Juan opened a garage. And she, he to she told you that there were other members former gang members, rehabilitated members, similar to her husband, who began working there. And she told you that in 2009, there was a very scary incident. They were walking down the street, and a member from the Latin Kings made comments, threats, to her husband. And that scared her. It scared her enough to go get a gun. She wanted one in the house. You heard from Juan, and he told you what happens when you are a gang member and you try to get out. He told you what it was like in prison when he was trying to get out. You also heard from, well, let me just back up again. One more thing about Maria. When Maria told you about March 9th in the evening, she told you that Pastor Unger had said that he would be over sometime before 10. And that sometime before 10, she hears him come in the house. And he calls out to her. She calls out to him. And then Pastor Unger going from the downstairs to upstairs where Juan is watching the game, goes and watches the game. She told you that she would have heard, because she kept the door open, she would have heard if her husband had left. She would have heard if the motorcycle had been cranked up. Again, your common sense. We all know about motorcycles. They're loud. They make a loud noise. It's something that she would have been alerted to. And she said, I never heard it. Mr. Von der Leyen wants to say that she's biased. She's married to him. Did he call any neighbor 
to say whether they heard the motorcycle turned on that night, cranked up, revved up. The fact that you haven't heard from anybody else but Lewis Grimes is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. Mr. Von der Leyen is right. You take your witnesses as you find them. But that doesn't mean that they're not lying. And I told you, and you heard about Lewis Grimes. Lewis Grimes, whose history is of violence, burglary, robbery, first degree burglary, now armed robbery and felony murder. Looking at a life sentence, how about we reduce it from a life sentence to a 50 year sentence? No, wait a minute, not a 50 years, not a 40, a 10 year sentence. And what does Lewis Grimes have to say to get the 10 year sentence? It's Juan Cortez. That's all he has to say. And what does he do? He says it. Well, let me ask you a question. Would you give your life savings? Would you give your child's college tuition to Lewis Grimes to hold for a month? And I would submit to you that you would not because you don't trust him. So why would you trust him in anything he said today? Why would you trust him in making a decision who his partner was? That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. The decision that you make today is an important decision. Your decision that you make today is a final decision. You can't come back tomorrow after you have returned a verdict and say, but wait, I still have a question. You don't all have to agree on your doubts. You just have to have a doubt. And you do. And I'm asking you on behalf of Juan Cortez to return a verdict that speaks the truth. Find him not guilty on all counts. Thank you. This on? Yes. Okay, thank you. May it please the court, counsel. <clears throat> Seems like most of what I said when I was up here before, defense counsel doesn't agree with. Well, I hope you're not surprised by that. Because if she agreed with what I said, there would be no need for us to be here, would there? But apparently what we want to do here is play the blame game. Blame me. Blame Vanderlaan. You should blame Vanderlaan. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
don't blame me because on Sunday, February 3rd, Juan Cortez gave his wife's pistol to Louis Grimes. And then the week of February 4th, the week of February 11, the week of February 18, the week of February 25, and the week of March 4th, they never reported a gun kept right next to their TV set missing. And it wasn't until Sunday, March 10th, when it was reported that a murder and an armed robbery occurred at Herman's restaurant, that Juan Cortez told his wife, seemed like we better report that pistol missing. Folks, this isn't a question of whether you would trust your money to Lewis Grimes. This is a fact that Juan Cortez did trust the commission of these felonies to Lewis Grimes. I'm going to say one more thing in rebuttal. Then I'm going to sit down and I'm going to let you do your work. Would you put that up there, please, Emily? <clears throat> Thank you. Opposing counsel said, blame Mr. Vanderlaan if he can't find somebody else in that restaurant who saw this happen. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to blame me because there's more than one witness to this crime who testified here. There's more than Lewis Grimes. Folks, there are two witnesses that put Juan Cortez in that restaurant. That second witness is Joseph Schmidt. Joseph Schmidt is the one who saw Juan Cortez pull up in a motorcycle before there was a bandana. It was Joseph Schmidt who, in a dying declaration, told his father, that's the man who was in here. It was Joseph Schmidt who lost his life because Juan Cortez saw Joseph Schmidt once again like he had before when he tried to shake him down for protection money. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Schmidt is another witness and was in that restaurant. And when you get back there and you think about that, you don't need to blame me. You need to come back with a verdict and you need to blame that man Juan Cortez, for malice murder, felony murder, and armed robbery. Once again, I thank you on behalf of the people of the state of Emory. What could be more fun? than listening to a pair of closing arguments from such fabulously accomplished and experienced attorneys. I want to give them an opportunity to comment very briefly on some devices you saw them use to the extent that it helps you tomorrow to frame your own. Uh, Bob, you started with the instructions and the verdict and quite literally put it up with this on, the, on the board so we could see it and hear it and told the jury how you wanted to and them to answer the verdict. Tell us your strategy for that, why you thought that was important. Well, it's twofold. <clears throat> I'm a firm believer that people retain information better and longer when they use more than just the sense of hearing. And I believe the studies that say when you see information and hear information, your retention level goes up somewhere along the lines of 67%. So that was one reason. The second reason is as you read the elements of the crime, it ties in with, hopefully, my argument that says, I don't have to prove he was in a gang. I don't have to prove he had a motive. I don't have to prove some of these things. Although I tried to loop back and say he did need money, there was a motive. So that was a 
I noticed double you took reason. a couple of double hits at that. Yeah. I don't have to prove that. And then he told you everything it was that he proved but didn't have to prove. Uh, Liz, I noticed you used the instructions in a rather different way. You didn't put them up. You used them to form your repetitive sentence. That is a doubt for which you may attach, you must attach a reason, and you must acquit. How many times did she say that? Paraphrasing the work she'd done earlier with beyond a reasonable doubt and paraphrasing the instruction completely accurately. Liz, talk about your strategy choices in making that use of the instructions. Unless you have a particularly narrow um, charge, um, the jury instructions don't generally help the defense. I mean, in this case really just boils down to reasonable doubt. And I think that people think and jurors think that it's a, um, this sort of elusive term um, and that they kind of all have to agree on the same kind of terms. Like they have to agree on their doubts and if not, they cross it out. But the point is, is that anything that you could think might be a doubt goes to the state failing to prove their case. And the more that you say it over again, the more that you can repeat to them this fact doesn't make sense, therefore it's a doubt, therefore you can attach a reason, therefore you must acquit, all goes together. And because that's the language of, of the section, basically the judge is telling them that, and that's why I say the judge is going to tell you you have to acquit. If you have a reasonable doubt, <coughs> you must acquit. But it's important, isn't it, also as you are paraphrasing, to be completely accurate in your paraphrase. Yes. Yes, because he's just looking for something where he can say, oh, well, no, I object reluctantly, Your Honor, because that's not the law. She has not stated it correctly. Liz, I wanted to ask you about something you did. You began by confessing that you were nervous. Uh, at another point in time, you said, if I didn't say it, maybe I just forgot. I think a lot of people feel that they have to be completely powerful and self-assured in the courtroom. Talk about that. Um, I violate the NIDA rules in that I am very much tied to my notes. I, I'm very much of a perfectionist. I like to say things the right way. Um, I did, you guys saw the opening the other day. Um, you can't read from them. But I sort of ask forgiveness, and I'm, through the trial, people have seen me make mistakes. I mean, we stutter. That's, that's something we do. Instead of freaking out about it, just address it right away. I mean, my handshake, they'll see that. I mean, in a closing argument like this, in Georgia, I have two hours to close in a murder case. And usually I'm going to close for close to two hours and sometimes want to go longer. And you come in with like a stack of paper like this. Well, rather than have them freak out, just tell them, listen, this is important stuff. Um, it's going to take us a little while. We're going to do it together. I'm going to keep the case going. But if I forget, you talk about it. I mean, a lot of things that we've learned is that jurors will go back in the jury room and say, obscure things like well she didn't talk about it so I guess it wasn't you know I guess we don't we don't need to talk about it either even though that might be one of their reasonable doubts and Bob something that came out of your mouth in a very sort of as if this were completely unpremeditated way uh, when you said something just occurred to me I'm just betting just a guess maybe that occurred to you before then no, it, yeah, it did. It just came to me. Objection. No, you're right. It, yeah. That's, uh, that's part of having fun. Yes, and the rights of the people in the jury to hear all of this. But, but notice, I, I pointed those two things out because it was in both cases so human and so unformalistic and so persuasive and gave us a sense of the credibility of these lawyers as well as their cases. Last thing I'd like, to, oh, I'm sorry, Liz, please. Well, I just think that one thing that you have to be really careful of, that you fall in, and, and we both fall into those traps. The state often can fall into this trap, and the defense can often fall into the trap, is sort of listening to somebody else's argument and hitting that panic level, like, oh, my God, he sounded so good. Because, honestly, he did sound really good. And, and that's why they presented the case. But you've got to say back to yourself, well, while he has an interesting argument, Let's go back to what we have as well. Don't just spend the whole time in your argument chasing him or him chasing me. It's a huge, huge pitfall. Um, be confident that you've got, he's going to have good points. 
He's got to. If he didn't have good points, he wouldn't have put up the case. You either would have pled it out or they would have dismissed it. And the same thing with the defense. I mean, sometimes you're just putting up a case because the offer's life and pony on up. But go back again to the basics, which is you're talking about the law and you're talking about reasonable doubt. And stick with that. Don't chase. Last, I want—I know we're all tired and, and ready to get going on our own trials, but last, I want to give people a chance to talk about rebuttal. Uh, Bob reserved for rebuttal, and I am expecting you prosecutors will want the last word tomorrow. Liz had to anticipate what rebuttal would be and deal with it, so I'd like to give them first, Bob, and then Liz a chance to talk about rebuttal. M mind if I stand when I talk about this one? No, you better. I think if you represent the plaintiff in a uh, civil case or the prosecution in a criminal case, rebuttal is an extremely powerful tool. And if you think you're going to come up with rebuttal, uh, during the course of the defense lawyer's argument, you are a much greater lawyer than I am. My way of thinking, you've got to prepare your rebuttal argument beforehand, way beforehand. And what you do is you try to hold back certain facts. You try to hold back on that rebuttal and hope that the defense lawyer doesn't cover it so thoroughly that it cheapens your rebuttal. In this case, I, I decided to hold back two facts for rebuttal. One, the five-week litany when this pistol was not reported stolen, and number two, that there was more than one witness to this, and that was Joseph Schmidt. Now, those were the two things that I had planned to talk about. The only trick is to say to yourself, how would I meet an objection if the defense lawyer said, that doesn't rebut what I was saying, so my whole listening time to Liz's closing argument is, how would I respond to that argument? And when she said, blame Vanderlaan, that's what I had. I'm going to rebut blame Vanderlaan. And I'm going to rebut blame Vanderlaan with the two facts that I tried to hold back for rebuttal. Liz, uh, your anticipation of rebuttal and how you dealt with it. Well, I mean, that was one of the reasons why I said that, you know, he gets the last word, so let me shove it all in while I can, but you object for me later on or talk about it in the jury room. I want them to feel obligated um, to help out. I I'm big on the guilt trip. I'm going to guilt trip you into doing what you told me and promised me that you were going to do, which is indirectly help me argue my own case. Based on the fact that I've told you, you guys have watched me, you see how I act, you do it for me, kind of thing. Um, I, do, I do agree. I think that the state, unfortunately, has um, the benefit of having the last word. I mean, they do. Um, and you don't get to get up and say anything else, and you really need to bite your tongue. And so try to cover as much as you can. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here, and, and you do whatever you can. But in the end, I think that you do rely on the fact that the jurors have listened to the evidence and can make some of those arguments for you anyways. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let's give them another round. <laughs>